we're going to talk about King Tahaka. Uh huh. You've never heard of him. Uh, we started this sermon series for Black History Month. I wanted to focus on the nation, on the continent, I'm sorry, of Africa. And I, we did a subtitle of Kings and Queens in Black Kings and Queens in the Bible. And so we started with King Nimrod, who, even though he was a king, and was the first king, the first man in the Bible to have a kingdom, they never gave him the title King Nimrod. We talked about that and the fact that he formed the first kingdom that, that's uh, named in the Bible. And then we went, last week we talked about who? Kandaki Amatori, Amanatori, I'm sorry, Amanatori, Kandaki Amanatori. And the fact that Kandakis were powerful queens and they were co-regents. They were not just a pretty face. They ruled and reigned and they ruled alongside their husband and they ruled alongside their sons when, um, when their husbands passed. And so those are the two that we've done so far. And today we're going back to another king. Now, we're gonna talk about King Tahaka. And he was the richest and one of the most powerful Kush kings in, in the world at that time. And I'm gonna to go to the scripture and read the scripture. Of course, we've already established that in the Bible, when they translated the Bible from Hebrew or Aramaic into Latin, they changed a lot of the people's names. Kandaki was changed to Candace. And um, Tahaka's name was changed to Tahira. So let's read the scripture first. So when the field commander heard that the king of Assyria had left Lachish, he withdrew and found the fighting along Lipna against Lipna. Now Sennacherib received a report that, and this is the king, Taharka, the king of Cush, was marching out to fight against him. So he sent messengers to Hezekiah with this word, this word. Say to Hezekiah, king of Judah, do not let the God you depend on deceive you when he says Jerusalem will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. So in other words, when your God tells you you're going to be all right, you're not going to be all right this time. They had heard about how the God of Israel would save them, this small nation from all of the, the big nations around them and from invasions and all and how he had kept them. And he's saying, I'm coming for you and your God's not going to help you. Surely you have heard that the kings of Assyria have done all what, what the kings of Assyria has done to all the countries destroying them completely. And will you be delivered? In other words, I done beat everybody I've gone to war with. I have conquered them. Do you think you're gonna be the one country to survive? Verse 12, did the gods of the nations that were destroyed by my predecessors deliver them? The gods of Gozan, Haran, Respa, and the people of Eden who were in Tel Asar? In other words, these are all of the countries I've defeated and their gods didn't help them and your God's not going to help you. Where is the king of Hamath or the king of Apod? Where are the kings of Leir, Sepharvian, Hena, and Iva? So the king sends <coughs> Hezekiah this message. I'm coming for you. I've taken everybody out on my way to you and you will be next. So Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. And then he went to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. Now that was a very wise move. He took the letter, went into the temple, laid it out before the ark and say, look, God, this is what the king said about you. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubims. So he's de describing the Ark of the Covenant. You alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. 
you have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. In other words, hear what this man said and see what he's about to do. Listen to the words of Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. Now, when he said that, he did the same thing David did. He put the battle into supernatural realm. This battle is not mine. This is your battle to fight because he's come against you and your name and your authority and your power. <clears throat> it is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their land. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them. But they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. In other words, all of these other countries that he had conquered, uh, they worshiped idols. Verse 19, now, Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, our God. Then Isaiah, son of Amaz, sent a message to Hezekiah. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I heard your prayer concerning Sennacherib, king of Syria. In verse 34, I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, they were all dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. One day while he was worshiping in his temple of the god of Nesrup, his sons, Adamelech, and Sherezer killed him with the sword, and they escaped the land of Ariok. And Eskardon, his son, succeeded him as king. So Hezekiah prayed to God to help him um, because he was under attack by the Assyrian king. God heard his prayer. Wouldn't that be nice if God just said, every time you pray for something, he came back to you and said, I heard your prayer and this is what's going to happen. But Hezekiah was wise enough to take, the, to take the letter to the temple, lay it before the Lord and lay the battle before the Lord and say, hey, he's, he's defending your name. And one thing that you'll learn in all of these different stories, when the Lord stepped in, when his reputation is at stake, God steps in. And that's what he did. He stepped in and he, he used the, the angels to slay um, 180,000 men. And, um, but on the other side of that, King Tahaka was coming up from the south. He was coming up from uh, the land of Cush to defend Egypt and to help Israel. So that's why his name is in there. So it was a twofold. He had help coming from two ways. At that time, King Tahaka was, a, was a, the most powerful pharaoh and he had the largest kingdom because he ruled both Cush and Ethiopia, all the land of Nubia. So let's go, let's do the backstory. <clears throat> the first dynasty king, which combined Cush and Ethiopia and the, the, the land of Nubian territory was named King Piye, P-I-Y-E, and that's the shortened version of his name. And he was the pharaoh of both Egypt and the king of Cush, which is now in the present day Sudan. Now, King Piye, um, he, he went and he took all of the different cities. He did the same thing that King Nimrod did, all of the different little feudal cities and, and, and territories that were around. He brought them all together into one nation and he ruled them. And, um, and then he took on the title of, of Pharaoh because the Egyptian culture and the Kush, Kush culture was very, they merged together actually. They, they were very entwined and, and they barred from each other. And so he combined it all into one kingdom and he ruled that kingdom, he ran that kingdom. Now, 
let's go back to Genesis 10 when we talked about Nimrod. And in Genesis 10, they have what they call the, the they call it the biblical account of the nations. And in the first sermon, we talked about Nimrod and we said that and and in verse six, remember Noah had three sons, and one of the sons was named Ham. And they they started listing the descendants of Ham, the Hamites, as they call them. The son of Ham was Cush, Egypt, Put, and Can and Canaan. Look what two countries end up by combining together under Pai, Cush and Egypt. They combined together. The sons of Cush were Septa, Havila, Septa, Ramah, and Septika. The sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan. Now, it's in, when I went back and looked at this, this scripture, I thought, my God, these are the countries. These, all of these became countries. All right, look at the names. They all became countries. And of this list, you got two kings that were mentioned. You have Nimrod, who was the king of Assyria. We'll get to the next page and we'll see that. And you see uh, Tahaka's relatives, um, Sabah and Sotika, were, they ruled after King Pai. And we see Sheba, which was Queen Sheba which is the other queen that's mentioned in the Bible. So you got one queen and two kings that ruled that were not in the Bible, uh, Subtika, but Tahar is in there. And you got the lands and the territories in the Bible all in Genesis 10, verse six. So Tahaka, Tahaka name was spelled when they went to his um, pyramid and they looked at the hieroglyphics. His name was spelled T-H-R-K. And no one really knows what T-H-R-K means. It's, it's a mystery. And when the, the translators start translating it, they look for words similar in their own language. And they came up with their own um, explanation for what T-H-R-K meant, for the Taharka. And they... One of the translations they came up with was young man. Another was young warrior. Another was exalted and examiner. Another was dull observer. And the last one from the Greek language was beastly. Guess which one they use the most whenever they describe Tahaka? Beastly. But his own people called him the warrior prince because when his father was ruling, King Pai was ruling and his uncle was ruling and his brother was ruling, he led a lot of the war, a lot of the war campaigns for his country. So they called him the warrior prince. As Pai's son, he ended up being the most powerful of all the black pharaohs. And he ruled in the fourth dynasty. And they, his name was King Tahaka, or they call him Pharaoh Tahaka, whichever one you want to call him. And so Tahira was Tahaka. He was the king of Kush, and, which, and they called it Kush. And they used Cush and Ethiopia interchangeably during the time of Hezekiah's kingship in Judah. And he was instrumental in deflecting the aggressive attentions of Assyria toward Judah. He protected Judah from Syria. His name is mentioned in one statement that occurs twice. Both this story is told in 2 Kings 19, which I read to you, and in, in Isaiah 37. King Tahaka is um, he went war against uh, Sanada Sherab and of Israel during the reign of Hezekiah, Hezekiah and he, they won the war and Hezekiah was safe. Cush was the father of Nimrod who became a mighty warrior in the earth. And we talked about Nimrod being a mighty warrior and a, not, a mighty hunter. But Nimrod formed his kingdom and look at the kingdoms that Nimrod formed. He, Babylon was formed by Nimrod and also Nimrod brought in Assyria. Assyria was the kingdom of the Northern Mesopotamia and that's where he built Nineveh. Assyria was where was the, um, the king, the king of Assyria was trying to take over and rule and dominate as much of the world as they could. And that's why they were headed toward Hezekiah in Israel because just like he put in his letter, I've taken out everybody before you and you're going to be next. And so 
These were also mentioned in Genesis 10. So we're just going back full circle to King Nimrod, his, his ancestry, his heritage, his rule and his reign and what happened during his time and then what happened during uh, this time. So Taharka ascended to the throne about 692 BC. And as I've said before, he was over Kush and he was over Egypt and he was over Ethiopia and it was the land of Nubia. He had a huge empire and he ruled and reigned for 26 years. He's regarded as the ruler who, who reunited the, the land after the defeat against the Assyrians by Shabak Taka. And so, and that was his uncle. So at one point, the, the Assyrians were always attacking Egypt. And if, when we get to the end of this, you'll see many countries invaded Egypt because Egypt was very wealthy. It had lots of natural resources. It had lots of uh, gold and, and silver. Egypt was a wealthy country and everybody wanted to rule and dominate Egypt. But when they were under Taharka's reign, Egypt was reign, they were fine with that. And like I said, the cultures assimilated and the Egyptians wanted to stay under his rule. And every time someone would, would threaten them, he would protect them. But the, the thing that stands out about Taharka's reign, it was the same thing about Amanatori, Queen Amanatori, was the buildings that they made. And they're still discovering things that he built even today as they continue to do um, uh, excavations in Sudan. He built a lot of things in the first 16 years of his reign, not just in Kush, but also in Egypt. And he established a kingdom in Napa. And a lot of things that they're discovering in Kush that they reverenced in, in, in Egypt, that they discovered in Egypt many years ago, and they thought, the Egyptians did it by themselves. Now they're finding out it was done under the direction and the rule and the reigning of these black pharaohs from Cush when they were over Egypt. And so when you go to Egypt now, I don't know if they've corrected history because they're just discovering this out, discovering this. Now let's talk a little bit about the languages. The Phoenicians had perfected the Abjad and the Hebrews had added vowels, notations using symbols. So you, the Y, He, and Va together form the name deity Yahweh. And that's how we know God, God is Yahweh who worship in Solomon's temple. Now from this Semitic alphabet, once, once they added the Y, why is a, is, a, is a vowel, the language started to expand. And when the Greeks came in, uh, they took the Semitic alphabet and they added the Greek alphabet. And then from, from the Greek alphabet, the Latins came in and took the Greek alphabet and created Latin. And then the Latins, then the English came in and took the Latin and created English. And you see the evolution of languages that started back from the, from the land of Cush. <clears throat> and when they go into these caves, I'm sorry, they're not called caves, into these pyramids and they, these tombs, they find all of these stories on the wall and they're, and, they're, and they're able to explain, read the stories and, 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 and piece together, put, I call it connecting the dots piece together the different wars and the histories and different things that happened during that time. And they're having to rewrite history as a result of what they're still discovering. So our entire modern written language was made possible because of the alphabets. And they found out the origin of these alphabets were in the pyramids. King Tahaka contributed by his buildings that have been perverted preserved and still telling stories today. What a legacy to leave. Now, I'm gonna end it this way. Um, Taharka warred against the Assyrians and he won. In the Bible, they called Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon. Uh, they called him a servant of Yahweh because his politics allowed for the wisdom of, of Judaism to be developed. 
and and while they were in Babylon and in the Persian Empire, the Jewish people flourished well in the in that uh, territory. The people of Judah became known as the Jews. Their Torah was compiled, and the post service was invented, and and the Pharisees class emerged, and the Talmud began to be written. So they, you know, remember I said in polytheism they weren't threatened by any gods. It's kind of like, well, no, it's not like in America today because. People in Christianity, they feel threatened by any other religion other than Christianity, which I don't understand. Uh, but in America, we have Judaism, we have Christianity, we have Muslims, we have Buddhism, we have all of these different religions, and we're not threatened by other people worshiping whatever they want to worship. And then on the Cyrus, which, which the evangelicals say that was Trump, was a, a reincarnation of, of the Emperor Cyrus. Cyrus decreed, designed, and funded the building of the second temple in Jerusalem. And um, I don't know why the evangelicals think he's Cyrus. I've read what they've said, and I haven't connected the dots the way they have. So last week, someone asked me, what about the, how did the 10 tribes get lost? The 10 tribes were, were gobbled up. The northern tribes of Israel ended up being a part of Assyria. And when Pharaoh, I mean, uh, Pharaoh Taharka went to war against Assyria and saved Judah, that's why Judah wasn't lost. That tribe was not gobbled up by Assyria. And when, when the 10 tribes, uh, as the empire, every empire rises and every empire falls, when the Assyrian empire fell, the 10 tribes just migrated all over the different, all over the continent into different countries. I said that Egypt, the poor land of Egypt has been um, invaded so many times and all the way back hundreds of, I mean, thousands of years ago. And the period that we're talking about is a period in, in between 712 BC and 664 BC when it was ruled by black Nubian pharaohs. There were four dynasties and King Taharqa was the fourth dynasty. And, uh, and then the Persians came in, Persian and Assyria, so they came in and they took over. Then the Greeks came in and they took over. And when Jesus was born, the Romans had come in and they had taken over the Middle East area. And so you look at all of the different times that, that they have been invaded. Why were they constantly invaded? I told you, because they were a wealthy nation and they were like one of the king jewels to have as part of your empire. Note, when, when the Romans and the Greeks tried to go all the way down and invade all of the Nubian territory, they, they, they never really succeeded in, in conquering the capitals because the Kandakis or the pharaohs would move further south. And the farther they got away, the, the more they went south, the more difficult it was for the Romans to maintain their supply route and to defeat the armies because they knew the land and the territory and everything else. So Kush, Nubia, and Ethiopia has never been under foreign rule. When King, when King Taharqa died, he died in 1664. He was buried in a large pyramid in Nura, which are there, like I told you, Nurai, which they're looking at now and they're discovering more things about him. And um, there's, there was a renewed interest in him because in 2010, they found a one-ton pink granite statue. And they were shocked to find that because that signified how well-respected he was and how much he, uh, how wealthy he was. I read an article that said that Taharka was was the richest man in the world for a long time. And I promise you, I went to try to find it and I couldn't find the article again. He was, he's considered one of the richest men that ever lived because of all of the different territories that he, he had, he ruled. And so he was just a one name mentioned when Hezekiah prayed and he, he appealed to Egypt to help. Egypt was being ruled by King Tahaka. And Tahaka responded and he protected Judah and he protected Judah as long as he was in rule. He let them be independent. And so 
that's the story, that's the backstory of Tahaka.